All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. It is Empowered's first BEE Askathon, so we're quite excited about it. By way of introduction, I am Matishka. I head up the customer success department at Empowered, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that really means in a second. I am going to let my team, however, introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Kurt. I'm the serious one. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. This is Ofense. I am quite the opposite of Kurt, so I'm the bubbly one. <laughs> <laughs> Morning everyone, I'm Sonika and I am the white girl in this BEE world. <laughs> Morning everyone, I'm uh, Celine Dile, but you can just call me Lee. Mm. I'm, I'm simple like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the team guys. So um, what I meant when I said customer success department. So Empowered, as you know, we are BEE software guys. We're the BE software partners that, that have coupled with you. But I think what people tend to forget is the sort of service aspect that gets coupled to that software component. So when you're buying this license, this annual license from us, from us, you're getting the sort of deep technical skills that come with this team. So every single person on this team has had over 10 years of experience in the BE industry. We've been verification managers, technical signatories, consultants to some of South Africa's largest corporates. So we'd like to think we know some. Um, and, and so what we've done from a um, from a services aspect or from a delivery model, we have entrenched those technical skills into the software usage so that you're getting the most out of your solution from Empowered and that we really are ensuring that we are adding value to your compliance journey and, and just helping you unearth some of the pain points, concerns, challenges you might have in your BEE journey um, and just you know, have that extra pair of BEE eyes there backing you, supporting you, ensuring that, you know, the the, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, essentially. So, um, you know, I, I definitely think that that sometimes that gets lost in translation and you forget about your account manager. You may not, you know, see them for status reviews, et cetera. So please lean on the the team that, that's going to be chatting to you today. It's exactly why we're here. It's to provide that, that, that BE expertise so that you can feel safe and secure in your compliance journey. Okay, so the purpose of the Askathon was really just to um, just have a chat really about BE questions. It's funny how as I was receiving some of the questions, I noticed that some of them were quite basic. Um, and it's funny that, you know, having so many years um, with BE being around that we still have confusion when it comes to some of these things. And it just talks to the interpretive nature of the codes, um, you know, things like that. So thank you so much for everyone who had submitted questions. Um, <clears throat> we're going to answer them just, you know, sort of a Q&A session, and then we're going to break for a little bit of a poll, and then we will try and get to the live question. So that's what's going to happen. All right, so the first question, heading straight into it. Um, it was more of a sort of example-based question, so I'm going to read it as is. Say our electricity bill is 20000 with 5,000 paid directly to ESCOM and the other 15,000 to municipalities and landlords. Then apparently you can only exclude the portion paid directly to ESCOM as a sole provider from your measurable procurement spend calculations. So I believe this uh, client might have had an ex experience where, you know, maybe a consultant or verification agency had, you know, um, chatted to her about excluding only a portion because, you know, she, for, just the way that the question structured, we can see that that seems to have been the experience. So, um, so yeah, we're going to jump straight into the answers. Okay, so I'll um, get to that answer. So, in terms of the codes, you are allowed to um, exclude spend when it comes to um, public entities or state-owned um, entities that enjoy a monopolistic trade. So in that case, if you can sort of like give a proper breakdown of the amount that went to ESCOM and the amount that went to the municipality, then you are allowed to exclude that from your procurement calculation. So when it comes to the amount that goes directly to the landlord, that's a totally different sort of like, um, um, sort of like treatment of the spend itself because your landlord is supposed to be a local 
BEE compliant supplier, right? In order for you to, to benefit when it comes to your procurement uh, spend. So um, what normally makes the process easier as well is when you capture those expenses in your ledger, try to sort of like um, allocate them accordingly. So your electricity, it's your electricity expense, which you can easily allocate to ESCOM because when you go through verification, you normally get just a sample of a few invoices that they check. Um, and normally when your landlord has broken down those expenses accordingly, then it's easier for them as well to take whatever you claim as a total spend to ESCOM or the municipality so that it makes it easier for the calculation for uh, exclusions. Um, so I hope that answers uh, the question fully. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, all right. The next question we received was from the same lady, actually, um, around a similar principle. So the, the next example was we've received or we have West Bank as our fleet manager. Um, so in the month, they record all transactions for the purchase of fuel and services of vehicles, and we pay them in one cumulative amount. The claimable amount under the West Bank BE certificate is only their fees and not the billable amount that goes to engine, successful, and other service providers. The same apparently applies to payment of tr to travel agents. You can only claim the amount that they add to the cost of the flight going to SAA or whichever service provider you're using, not the cost of the flight itself. Yeah, so I'll answer this one. Um, so there was actually a guidance note released by the BE Commissioner a couple of years ago on this. And um, in it, she clarified that any pass-through procurement has to be traced to the actual third party receiving that pass-through payment. So really the important thing to remember here is look at where the transaction is being recorded in the books. So if we look at, for example, the travel agent, the travel agent will send you an invoice, it will have the cost on for the flight, maybe a rental car, and then also a fee. So the fee itself is going to the actual travel agent, but the cost for the flight, that's going straight to SAA actually and passing through the travel agent. The same with um, the rental cost. So that's not being, that transaction wouldn't be recorded in the financials of the travel agent. It would be recorded in the financials of SAA or the um, rental car company. So that's really the main consideration there. Um, the same would apply to a credit card, for example. So if you spend money on your credit card at lots of different places, you can't just claim the full cost under the credit card company. You would have to only claim the finance cost or the fees under the credit card company and the rest would go to the different places where you spend that money which is difficult to keep track of um, but unfortunately that is the correct way to do it okay next question designated groups re relative to that what is considered as a rural area in order for a supplier to claim they have designated group status and what proof should they provide um so with um rural unfortunately there isn't really a sort of like explicit definition in the codes in terms of what is considered a rural area but the general consensus is that any area that's outside a town or a city would be considered a rural area in terms of how it's verified we believe verification agencies will use their sort of like professional discretion um, they would obviously need um, evidence in terms of the geographical area or map that allocates that place. Um, you would need maybe some sort of proof of uh, residential address and things like that. It could be in a form of um, whether it's letters that are acceptable as proof of address or an affidavit that could be uh, provided just to prove the, the sort of like area that you live in. So um, that's about it. All right, next question we received. If a company pays a professional member registration fee for its employees, can that be claimed as skills development spend? Okay, so with that one, um, a membership fees are just professional fees and not a training expense. So if they're not linked to any um, training program, it would be a difficult to, to link them to a category under, a, under the learning um, matrix, program matrix. 
So on its own, um, if for instance, there's no seminar or conference or workshop, so on its own, it would not lead to a qualification or credits for registered units or any kind of development. So it, it's just a payment for a recertification of membership. Of membership. It's, it's, not a, it's not a training expense. Okay, in relation to ownership, um, the generic scorecard recognizes sale of assets under ownership. Does the property sector charter allow for the same? And what is needed in terms of documentation to substantiate such a claim? So the property sector code does make allowance for sale of assets. Um, it actually specifically refers back to the amended codes of good practice. There's also a general provision with sector codes that where the sector code is silent, the provisions of the um, general amended codes would be applicable. There is some qualification criteria attached to claiming sale of assets. So just make sure that you um, are meeting those so that you don't have any issues when it comes to your audit. So to substantiate your claim for sale of assets, you need to provide certain documentation. So basically you would need your standard ownership documents that you would have um, to prove your black shareholding. Then for the specific sale, you would also have to have the value of the transaction. So basically the value of the asset that you are um, selling. Then you also need the value of equity instruments held by black people in the separately identifiable related business. So basically the value of black ownership in the related business that you're selling the asset to. Then also the carrying value of any acquisition debt of black people in the separately identifiable related business. So I hope that answers your question. It's a bit of a complicated thing to claim. But yeah, that's basically what you need. And also just maybe for, you know, the person that had asked that question, um, you're obviously, like I said, you know, um, to dig deeper with your account manager. So after the session, if that, you know, you still want to unpack some of the answers that we're giving at a high level, um, then please just reach out to any one of us or, or the support team. You guys know that we've got the on-demand support as well so that we can help unpack those, those, these answers with you. Okay, next question. How do you determine the correct disability as a valid disability within your company? So I'm going to take this one. Um, the definition of disabled has always been there. So it's defined in the codes. And I think where people have um, um, trouble <laughs> in that the application of that definition sometimes obviously becomes quite heavy, especially because some verification agencies will have their own interpretations and their own documentation required from an evidence perspective. In the codes, in the amended codes of good practice, the definition of disabled, it refers to section 54 of the Employment Equity Act. And then, so you reach for the Employment Equity Act and then you start unpacking that. And in the Employment Equity Act, um, they define um, having to really focus on the, the disability relative to the work environment rather than like the diagnosis of the impairment. So not what it's called, but you know, how it how it is um, practical in a work environment. So from a more formal perspective, it is defined as a person having a physical or a mental impairment that is generally recurring and that in some way, shape or form hinders this person um, within their working environment. So that could be from them having access to a job versus them actually being employed and then having access to growth opportunities or enhancements or advancements within that within that role or within that job. So um, again, you know, I'm sort of giving you the summary or the high leveled answer. There is a lot to un unpack because within the Employment Equity Act, what it does is it starts looking at the word impairment. Okay, so you're saying physical or mental impairment and then it starts breaking that down to say exactly what we think that could mean um, but so those would be the sort of general principles it would be that physical mental impairment um, that's generally recurring and that hinders the work environment in some way shape or form um, again if that's not sufficient enough for you to be able to disclose you know this is a disabled person versus this is not um, then we can always unpack it you know you guys can reach out to us like i said any idea on the gazetting of the new transport sector codes? We are currently tracking on both revised generic and old transport, both forwarding and clearing and road freight. I'll take that one. 
Um, so currently there is nothing in the market whereby there is guidance as to when it either will be repealed or that amended uh, transportation sector code will be gazetted. Um, it is, yeah, the market is, the no information is being given as to what's, gonna, what's happening. So currently you'll probably have to track on both depending on what your requirements are from your clients. Uh, for some clients do like to see how you would track on the amended codes versus uh, the old codes. So sorry, that is just the current state that we've been put in by the transport sector codes. Yeah, and just to add to it, I mean, not for lack of trying to find out, you know, I think there's always murmurs and rumbles in the industry about movement or things changing and then nothing seems to just happen. Dies off, yeah. from that. All right, next question. Um, how can we pull data such as salary info from our SAGE payroll system into management control, skills development, so your HR elements? And if so, are there any other systems we can pull, um, I think the intention was in data into? Um, so there was, this was actually posed as two separate questions that I sort of merged um, because they, they, you know, are relative to the same answer or concept, and that is integration. So, yes. The short answer is yes, Empowered can integrate. We have built our system in such a way that we can pretty much connect to any source system or any ERP system. Um, so what that means is that um, our system is taught how to go and read from X system, a, uh, a flat file um, extraction. And so that, you know, we'd obviously be able to set up teaching our system to go monthly, quarterly, depending on your reporting cycle, to said source system or ERP system, go and fetch a file of data that's already being extracted. And then, you know, the systems will pretty much talk to each other. So where integration, I think, gets a little bit um, more sort of, uh, you know, technical or in-depth is just teaching the systems how to talk to each other. So can it be done? Absolutely, it can be done. Can it be done with Sage? Yes, it can be done with any Sage product and or generally any other product, to be honest. So that's the way that we built it so that we can play nice in the playground with everybody. Um, and so uh, from an integration perspective, where, where we would need to sort of, yes, it can be done. So the next step on top of that would be then unpacking exactly what the source system is and then figuring out how to get that source system to do this extraction on a like I said, monthly, quarterly, annual cycle, depending on how you're reporting. And then pretty much that data gets pushed into the system so that there's no spreadsheet uploads and filtering and formatting and, and that sort of thing. We do find that there's a lot of interest in our integration product. And yet we also find that, that you know, companies will say, actually, you know what, it's okay. I'm, I'm comfortable with the spreadsheet upload because we, we also get good feedback that the template uploads are quite user-friendly um, and, you know, take, you know, a few minutes a month um, for the more sort of familiar users. So if you do want to find out more about integration, um, I have to mention that it is at an additional cost because there would be a development component that is needed to go and get our technical team to go out into yours, your environment and figure out the source system that you're using and then, you know, just build those um, plugins so that they make sure that we make sure that, you know, the systems are talking to each other, et cetera. Please may you provide examples for the different program categories under skills development. Slee, you are muted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So I'm just gonna go through the um, um, learning uh, program metrics and just give a few examples here and there. So category A would be bursaries. Um, so if you pay uh, tuition fees for your employees or for black students, that will be a category A. And then B is internships. So that means that there must be a mixed mode delivery with institutional learning as well as supervised learning in the workplace in order to achieve a degree or a diploma. Um, a few examples there would be, if, if I, to give an example there, it would be maybe an electrical engineering student in, at Stony University that needs P1 and P2 training before they can graduate and become qualified um, engineering technicians. And then uh, category C is structured learning in the workplace with mentoring or coaching uh, after achieving a, a degree that results in licensing or registration with a professional uh, body. 
So uh, examples would be articles for candidate attorneys or CTA students uh, registering with, with SICA. Okay, and then category D is um, learnerships and apprenticeships that are registered with the CETA resulting in a, a qualification. Category A is structured work integrated, uh, work integrated learning, which may include institutional learning that results in credits awarded for registered um, unit standards or just continued professional development. Category F is um, informal training, such as having workshops or conferences, seminars, or, or short courses. And then category G is internal uh, informal um, training um, from one employee to another, sort of like over the shoulder if, you, if an employee is showing another employee how to, to do their job. How would we load evidence onto the tool and how auditors would be able to sample from that? So Empowered has over the years introduced terminology like DAP, which is Digital Audit Partner, or, um, you know, Back Office for Audit. Um, so BO4A is, is the, the term you might have heard. Um, and, and for those of you who do follow us on social platforms, you would have seen that we um, we have verification agencies that we partner with that we term as our digital audit partners. Now, what that means is that we have over time started building some digital audit features within the BE toolkit so that um, we can, if you know, at a very small level and build up to a large, a large level, um, accommodate for a digital audit. So that would be submitting your claim online, being able to sample online, being able to go and upload detailed evidence against those, against those samples online. And then of course, having your verification agency come through, review the documents, um, you know, within the toolkit, accept that document, reject that document. So we've got little sort of uh, triggers that an analyst can even, you know, tick and say, no, this ID copy is actually not clear enough and reject it so that the client understands, okay, I need to go and get maybe a certified color ID copy or whatever the case is. So we've built what we term digital audit features within the BE toolkit and we're constantly evolving that concept so that we can add more digital audit features that would um, enhance or enable a digital verification to an extent. So at the moment, what we have live is being able to, obviously being able to submit your claim um, to the verification agency. You can sample from within the software and you can upload detailed evidence per element, per indicator, per sample of that indicator. So it's detailed. So we're driving down to the training intervention or we're driving down to the person that was on that training intervention. It's very detailed. Um, and... Um, yeah, there's a few features that you guys might see coming in, in the next few weeks to months, but yeah. So from a um, evidence perspective, in terms of teaching you how to use that functionality from within the system, we have what we call um, Empowered Zendesk, and it's a knowledge base online. Some of you may have or may have not used it. It's essentially just, it's a range of articles and, and self-help guides that the Solution Center has, um, has drafted so that, you know, in the event that you'd need to get a hold of us or it's after hours, weekends, whatever the case is, we've got this knowledge base built up of all of these articles. Um, one of the articles that are sitting on there is exactly how to upload evidence. So um, in that Q&A document that I'm gonna be emailing out to each attendee, there's gonna be a little link to a Zendesk um, website. That website will have the article on exactly how to upload, uh, upload evidence. And it's a very paint by numbers approach. So you'd literally say step one, and it's got a screenshot of exactly where you need to click. So, um, so I hope you don't feel like we're not answering your question. Um, we definitely will unpack it in a, in a self uh, help guide that we would be sending you. Okay, next question. Did anyone join the YES program? My team and I had quite a giggle about this one. I just want you guys to know. How did they find it? And was it beneficial for their BE? Um, so on this one, I'll, I'll take the answer. Um, so yes, uh, to, um, um, there's a couple of our clients that has gone through the YES program and they have found it beneficial with their scoring. Some of them were able to increase their scoring and some of them were able to maintain um, the levels that they previously had. Um, there was some guys that had uh, little bit of problems whereby they 
didn't initially maintain the level that they were supposed to maintain, mm -hmm. but they were able to have discussions with um, the DTI with regards to getting a recognition for the drop in their current status and therefore being recognized for this initiative. We also have partners that have implemented this um, through their company base. And if you guys are interested um, to hear from those partners, please uh, reach out to me. I'll, de I'll definitely um, share the information with you and they, you can have a discussion with them as to see how successfully they implemented the YES program with their clients. Okay. All right. So from a submission perspective, there were actually more questions, um, but it came through from direct uh, engagement. So it, it wasn't through the webinar. So I, I handled it then outside the webinar, like a normal interaction would um, take place between a client and his or her account manager. So, um, so I can see there are some Q and A's in the sort of chat box. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in a second. These webinars are conducted on a monthly basis. Um, from the uh, customer success department, what we do is we go and we do a educational based webinar and a content based webinar. So, uh, or educational training uh, based webinar and content webinar, sorry. So the educational training would be the systems training. So we do a standard BE toolkit and supply management system training every single month. Um, so you guys must, you know, those come in handy when you just need a refresher or you've got new users um, that you want trained up or whatever the case is. So you're more than welcome to make use of those webinars. They're accessible to you guys and they're free. And then the content-based webinars are essentially where we try and make topics um, available to you that we think you want to hear about. We call them demand generated webinars. So we want to come through every month and unpack a topic that, you know, means a lot to you or that you're just curious about, or that you just really want to get, you know, brushed up from a technical knowledge uh, perspective. So the poll that I'm going to put live on the screen now is pretty much that it's just topics suggested for the, for future webinars. If you can vote on whichever one you'd like to hear about the most. So the four options that were given were bonus points and enhancers on the BE scorecards. A deep dive into skills development was the second one. Pitfalls of ownership was the third one. And what evidence would I need for what was the last one? And deep dive into skills development is the clear, clear winner. So um, we're in April now. So the May webinar would be a deep dive into skills development. So please watch out for that webinar invite as and when you receive it from myself or our marketing team. Okay, first question from Terence Gibbs. Regarding enterprise and supply development projects, what is the duration in years from initiating project that a company can recognize the benefits or the spend before considering renewing those projects? Okay, I'm gonna take the first one or any, see unmuted. <laughs> I'll take the first one. That's fine. Okay. So from my side, you know, I think with enterprise and supply development contributions and projects, it's really just a matter of, um, of the intention behind those projects. So in my mind, there is no set duration that it gets locked and, you know, you can't claim that project anymore versus, um, you know, having to start a new project or whatever the case is. So as long as that black owned QAC or EME, enterprise, whether it's your supplier, if you're claiming it under supply development or not a supplier and you're claiming it under enterprise development, as long as there's benefit being accrued to that beneficiary, that you would be able to claim such a benefit. Now, of course, the only um, catch <laughs> would be that you would have to um, figure out how that claimed amount is being categorized according to the benefit factor matrix. So under enterprise and supply development, there's a matrix that outlines the different types of contributions that you can make. Um, so as long as you are contributing to this black owned QEC or an EME, um, they meet the definition of a valid supply, uh, a valid beneficiary. They are, you know, it's a valid contribution type. You should be able to claim that amount for as long as that company is deriving that benefit. Um, so if you, if you do have, um, uh, Taryn, sorry, you know, and again, I'm going to, um, maybe just take that offline or you, we can unpack that. But if you did have an instance where, um, you know, you prompted that question because perhaps it was held back for a certain period of time, um, please reach out to the account manager. I'd love to unpack stuff like that. 
Okay. Um, okay. The second is anonymous. <laughs> um, I feel like a radio prep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think I know the question, but I needed to go back and finally convince management. We pay for driver's licenses and claim the costs under training. Driver's license not needed to do their jobs. Is this allowed as a skills claim? Team, anybody? Am I just going to be answering all of you? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so for this one, um, but also when I'm done, my team can jump in and just let me know if they have anything on this. But I think it's pretty much the same as your, as your membership fees. If, if the driver's license is not linked to any training that the driver maybe needs to go through, then uh, we cannot put it under any of the categories, you know? So yeah. uh, it will be difficult to claim it for, 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 for BE points. Yeah, so just to add to that, because 100% agree with Sli and I saw Sonica nodding as well. So, um, and it's just just to like this slight note that Sli said, hey, reach out. Because sometimes, you know, from a BE perspective, these things are up for interpretation. Um, and so we generally, from a, an empowered perspective, we definitely try to advise our clients more of a conservative approach. Uh, we rather not be liberal and push the envelope and have our clients get their fingers burnt when the verification agencies feeling grumpier that day uh, than they normally would. So, so I definitely also support Slee's answer in terms of just, you know, you, the, again, if, you know, if I were to touch on Terence's question around the intention of that enterprise in supply development, it's again, the intention of the skills, you know, you're claiming points for upskilling your staff or non-staff unemployed, you know, sending someone for a driver's license in, in, a, in a, a job role where they are required to use a vehicle, um, it's not really upskilling, uh, upskilling that person. It's, it's almost, you know, bare minimum that's absolutely needed uh, to comply to South African law. So, um, so I don't know that we would, or that I would claim that under skills development as well. Apologies. Okay, Veronica Jack. How do you calculate how do you calculate economic benefit under ownership if a company has not declared dividends in the verification period? So um, I can answer that. So basically, if you haven't declared dividends, your verification agency will look at your shareholders agreement um, and see what rights attach to the shares that the owners hold. So depending on the type of share, what economic benefit or percentage of economic benefit is the shareholder entitled to? And then they will also do interviews with your shareholders and just confirm um, if dividends were declared, are you entitled to X percentage or X amount? Um, and if you have a couple of years where you don't declare dividends, they might start asking, um, for reasons why or looking into it a bit deeper they might want a declaration to say you weren't able to declare dividends for whatever reason but you're basically it will revert back to the shares um, and the rights attaching to those shares cool. thank you all right next question from Andrea Duplessis um, question on the software okay it seems unclaimable spend is included in total skill spend. Example, foreigners and H and S. Um, and then I'm not sure if question two is re related, so I'm going to read it out as well. Does it automatically cap example travel costs to 15% in the invoice value when captured? Or when does the cap kick in? Um, okay, so the, okay, so the two questions are different. So the first is, it seems unclaimable spend is included in total skill spend. I am not sure exactly i'm gonna i'm gonna try and, and take that one um not sure what you mean by unclaimable uh andrea so i don't know if you could maybe if i could park that question and, and if you could maybe elaborate on it or copy it and ask it again we just i'm not sure what you mean by unclaimable spend um the health and safety mandatory spend Yes. Okay. So <laughs> I think I know exactly what Andriette is asking in this case. And this is uh, one of those instances where it's 
more specific or customized to their report uh, since they are my client. Okay. Um, <laughs> what she means is on their specific report, when they see the field for total spend, it, it does actually include all the spend, right? Uh, but it's not something that you can see on the normal BE toolkit or the, the, the system itself. Uh, on the system, it will only recognize what is measurable. In this case, we are talking uh, expenditure on your Africans, uh, colors, as well as Indians, right? Um, so it does take it into account in that specific field that you are referring to, Andriette, but not when it comes to calculating your skills development points. So I hope that makes sense, right? And the second question about the cap on travel costs and all those other overhead costs. So it does actually do the capping as you capture it. However, remember, this only happens if it's captured in the specific field. So when you capture the travel cost under the cost cost, it will not calculate the 15% cap because recognizing the spend as the actual training cost. However, when you capture your um, a cost under the travel field or, or column itself, the system then immediately automatically calculates uh, that 15% cap and the rest goes with all the other overheads like travel and accommod I mean, accommodation, ca um, catering and all those other costs. Right, and I think I might as well just jump to your other question regarding the calculation of category G training. So your oh, question said- oh, Okay, sorry, I was just gonna say read out the question for those that oh, can't see the question. Uh, so the question says, um, question on calculation of category G training. I have 15 staff members at different salaries trained for an hour by a manager on COVID safety procedures. They use my uh, boardroom and drink coffee and um, assuming other things, right? What can I claim? So in that case, first of all, when it comes to the cost of training, you can only claim the manager's hourly rate. So in terms of the 15 staff members that are being trained, you cannot claim their salary cost or a portion of it whatsoever, right? So what you claim would be the manager's hourly rate if it was just an hour that was spent in the training session, then it's just that hourly rate that you will obviously split uh, among the 15 um, members in terms of the benefit of the cost, right? In terms of the, the coffee and whatever other sort of like catering uh, expenses, you can for as long as you can prove it. And it's normally a sort of like difficult um, process when you have to prove exit because you normally buy coffee for your entire office or, or for whatever other reasons, right? And if you can prove that they have had this much coffee, which cost this much, then I'm, I'm sure you can um, claim that under your, your catering expense. And then um, what else? So I'm, I'm assuming those are the two that you can claim in terms of training. Am I missing anything there, Tim? Mm. No, uh, I think you covered everything. Cool. Um, okay, next question. Don't know if this is the right platform, uh, but can a measured entity split the yes for youth employees between hosting and sponsoring? Example, can the measured entity host for internally and sponsor the rest of the target? You can split it. Um, I have seen companies that split it before. Um, but yeah, when, when it comes to yes, the, the people at yes are very helpful. Um, and we are in communication with them quite often. We can always, um, refer you to someone They They would obviously be able to help you, you know, in depth or give you detailed advice on how it would all work, but you can split it. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, paying for school fees of our employees, will this be seen as spend under skills development? If so, what category? Um, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm thinking there's a gentleman that might want to answer it, but if not, I'll go for it. <laughs> we always joke with Kurt. You can answer it. Kurt's a sucker for skills, and he's so harsh when it comes to the skills element. Yeah, so that's why I, uh, I don't want to answer it because I know I'm, I'm going to be too harsh on it. So, so let me take, take that one. I'll take that yeah. one. Um, so, I mean, there's no rule. 
that's the short answer. There's no rule that says it has to be this or it has to be that. When the amended codes of good practice came out and they included um, spend for unemployed you know, or training for unemployed staff, it opened that sort of door for scholarships and you know um, that sort of a thing. Um, so there's no like rule, unfortunately, what there's a general guiding principle that we use um, internally or that I use at least um, from sort of, you know, secondary downwards, I actually wouldn't even suggest to my clients to claim that under skills development, I would suggest for that to be claimed under ACD or socioeconomic development. Um, and then tertiary and above that I would um, allow for skills development because, and I feel like you're, you know, providing more training or, or upskilling that person to have access to the economy for employment thereafter because tertiary onwards. So, um, so when you say school fees, it, you, you, you could mean two things, but I would imagine secondary down, so anything up to matric down should be claimed under ACD um, and everything above that, so tertiary up would be um, claimed under skills development. So I don't know if that answers your question, but again, that was just, you know, it's, it's my personal interpretation. The team can challenge me or agree if, if they feel like. Um, again, it's, you know, possibly a little bit more conservative, but I would rather have that conservative approach, then, you know, be liberal and have the verification agency kick it out at the worst time, which would be at audit. So, yeah. So, so, so <laughs> I, I have quite a, a strong opinion on this. I think that um, you can claim it under skills development from the age where the, the child or the person is allowed to legally work. So I think that's 15. Um, I think it is 15. So for me, it comes down to skills development. The score is based on the EAP targets, economically active population. You can be economically active from about 15. So then it can be skills development. Younger than that, definitely socioeconomic development. But that's, that's, yeah, that's my opinion. <laughs> wanted to also add there so because i'm reading the question and it says school fees for our employees so um when we are talking now um sort of like a, a, a tertiary qualification right they are studying for a diploma a degree masters or whatever uh that should qualify and that would be your category a spend right you can also have in there and remember uh, they allow also scholarship in the amended codes where you can claim it as skills development. So it could be something like they are maybe completing their metric uh, at an um, ABET institution, for instance, that you can also claim, and that would be category A as well. Yes. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, okay, next question. Company provides an asset to a beneficiary such as a laptop, which is still functional. However, the asset is fully depreciated. How can we claim this on the scorecard, if at all? So, okay. so Sunny, <laughs> straight in. I would say yeah. there's no claim because um, usually the value would be the asset value on the books that you would claim. So if it's fully depreciated, the value on your books is zero, I would say there's nothing that you can claim then. Yeah. So that would definitely, again, be the conservative approach just to add to that in the event. Because this is the thing. Sometimes accounting principles, um, you know, don't, don't tie into the sort of everyday practicality of it. I've got a laptop that's quite old and probably depreciated to zero, but it's still fully functional and still working and able to do whatever it needs to do. So, um, so I would say that in the event that the that it is fully depreciated, if you could get an evaluation done, and, and it's probably going to be a, a lower end value um, um, to say what that laptop could be resold as, um, that then maybe you'd be able to include under socioeconomic development or possibly enterprise and supply development if you're if you're donating to a ED or an ST beneficiary. But you know those are the sort of pushing pushing the envelope or pushing the boundaries. Uh, yeah, you have a valuation that could work. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question. If the OHS training is accredited, firefighting, first aid, etc., can it be claimed? Yeah, so with this one, because unfortunately none of the industries uh, has that um, a list of what is considered 
mandatory. mandatory sectoral training. But if it is considered mandatory for the, your sector, then it could um, count as mandatory training, which is not claimable. Because at the moment, only the construction, construction charter has, actually, uh, has clarity on this to say that mandatory training is only limited to recertification or toolbox training and, and, and stuff like that. So at the moment, it's a, it's a matter of, well, is it mandatory or not for the sector? And then if the answer is no, you can claim it. Okay, I am sort of cognizant of the time. So we're gonna try and go through these as quickly as we can. If we don't finish, um, then like I said, everybody's gonna get a copy of the questions and the answers. So um, fear not. Okay, next question. Why is empowering supply info required on the database? My understanding is that this term has been discontinued. So it hasn't been dis. Oh, I jumped straight into the answers. It hasn't been discontinued. The <laughs> so the DTI released that sort of that like blanket statement that covers everybody and protects everybody and deems everybody empowering until further notice. Like, and the notice actually says that. So um, you know that until further notice could be any day. It could be today. It could be a week from now. It could be five years from now. So so everybody's got this blanket protection of the empowering status until further notice. So I always tell um, my clients just to constantly ensure that you know they are aware of the empowering requirements and that they that you know they pick their three or whatever the case is and that they ensure that they are empowering. So that in the event one day this this statement gets. Um, what is it revoked or retracted I'm not sure what the terminology is um, then then you would be safe and that you would be deemed empowering if you were to actually go through that exercise and get sort of that test done because as you know and you know not being deemed as empowering is is as good as being non-compliant you could be a level one without an empowering status and you you'd probably be as good as non-compliant from a procurement supply perspective so so it's not discontinued. It is just, I think, because that notice happened so many years ago that everybody just sort of forgot about it. It, um, it could very well, you know, come to life any day, any time. So um, the advice is to constantly just be aware of the requirements for empowerment and constantly just make sure that you are meeting them as an organization so you don't get caught with your pants down. <laughs> okay, next question. We recently... Uh, Ventishka broken up. Am I frozen? We can hear you clearly. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Maybe, no. it's, yes. Maybe it's quite side. Um, okay, we recently appointed a canteen service provider and have procured catering equipment and remodeled the canteen as directed by the provider. Are we able to claim the spend as part of ESD? If so, how? So, um, for this one, I'm assuming it's for your enterprise development. Question is, can you claim the equipment that you've bought for, for the canteen? And the answer is yes. You can claim it under either enterprise development or supplier development, but you cannot, you know, just you cannot um, double claim that spend. Um, it's either enterprise development or supplier development. And you can claim the exact cost that you guys paid for, for, for that equipment. Yeah. That and cost. Yes, that would be a direct cost. Sorry, Miti, I just wanted to pop in a question that's also enterprise development related, that's more in a chat than the questions. And this was sent by Sivongile, who says, how do you claim for ED expenditure? For example, that salary cost for employees if you have an in-house incubation program. Anybody? Sorry, guys. So offensive. Just before we answer that question, um, so are there questions also coming? Because I can only see the Q and A as the host. So are there questions also coming through the chat as well? One yeah. two, okay. All right. Okay. So I'll take that one from Simi, uh, from Simingile. So Simingile, you can claim um, the overhead cost, right? Um, so what what will happen is that you will claim the department basically, and that department will then be rated against overhead cost, which is limited to um, that's got the recognition of seventy percent of the total cost that you can claim. So you will have to add the salary cost of that specific um, incubator or the department, and then that will be your claim. If there's any other costs associated in that cost center, you will also be able to claim that. Just be aware that there is a limitation of seventy percent that you will be able to claim. Thanks. 
Okay, next question. Um, what other SD initiatives are claimable? So I'm assuming SD is in supply development uh, because I know that we covered one of the sort of you know, skills development categories in, in the actual uh, like the slides. Um, so again, uh, so under the ESD section, you will have what we, we call a benefit factor matrix. And those outlines the different types of contributions a company can make um, to their beneficiaries. So, um, so I'll definitely also include that extract in the sort of question and answer so that you pretty much, you know, the matrix identify the sort of type of contribution and, and, and how it's done and how it's measurable. So as long as you can, again, the intention is there for the benefit to be derived from this uh, black owned beneficiary, um, you should be able to claim it. So um, I'm going to unpack the actual different types because I mean, there's, there's, lots of things from direct costs to indirect costs to time spent. So you could have your monetary and your non-monetary contributions. So it's quite a large answer to unpack. So um, definitely watch out for that um, matrix in that uh, email that you guys are going to get. Okay, then we have a please send me contact details. Unfortunately, however, the person who asked that question marked themselves as anonymous. So if you can maybe just uh, resubmit or um, with with your uh, name so that we can uh, we can actually answer that question, please. Sorry. Um, okay, we are actually out of time, and it's the last question. Oh, just maybe check for me if there's one on the chat because I can't see that. Um, if the company takes on graduate internships as defined by the CETAs, students who have completed their qualifications, so they do not have the work integrated learning letter. Can this be claimed in any way? So uh, I'm not sure what it means. Graduate internships as defined by CETA. So I think there's there's a, a, a separate um, definition of internships in CETA, but not which is not in the VE codes in the learning program matrix. But for an internship to qualify for BE purposes, it has to have a formal component, it has to be formally recognized it's required for that person to um, achieve their degree or diploma. So you need the internship before that person can actually achieve the qualification. So if it's not required for that, and it's just like your own, um, you're taking in a graduate, giving them internal training, um, and calling it an internship, which in everyday terms you would call that an internship, that's not an internship in terms of the BE requirements. So that would literally then just be um, category G internal training. If you have registers or records of the training, you could claim that as category G, but that's all that that would be. Okay. All right, Kurt, you look like you want to add something. Are you happy? No, 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 it's, it's fine. It's just, it's... Okay. Yeah, I definitely can see. Um, definitely answer the questions. Okay. Professional, we did that one. Uh, one question okay. from Ronald. Um, and it says, which initiative or which initiatives are considered for socioeconomic development? And I believe the same would go in terms of what other initi uh, SD initiatives can be done. So there's a, um, a matrix as well in terms of the socioeconomic development contributions that can be done. Um, what we can do, I don't know, we can share that or Ronald, if you can reach out directly to us, we can give you a list of uh, the types of contributions that you can make that do qualify or socioeconomic development initiatives. Yeah, I can definitely share the matrix because it's similar to the you know, uh, enterprise and supply development matrix that I'm talking about, you get one for SED as well that outlines the different types of contributions and, you know, what you can claim. Because with the benefit factor matrix, it's just important to note that, yes, companies do consider different types of contributions, but there's different weightings that get assigned to those contributions as well. So, um, you know, people are almost biased in that they want to hit the types of contributions that um, they can uh, claim a higher percentage for, but we can definitely share those, those, those extracts with you guys. I think, I mean, I know we're out of time by three minutes, but um, that was bang on time, I feel like. Um, but, but yeah, so I think there's no other questions. I can't see any. I think we've 
handled everything. If we didn't and if we missed a question, apologies. Um, and that we will go through them again just to make sure that we have um, we have answered them in the uh, email that you guys are going to get um, sent after this webinar. So um, I would personally like to thank every single person for joining. Um, you know, it's, it's always nice answering these questions and just getting our little BE geek, uh, geek on. <laughs> so my team definitely enjoys these sessions. So, um, so thank you so much for taking the time to, to spend with us. Unfortunately, BE is up for interpretation. Sometimes the codes were, you know, there's just some gray areas. So while we can advise to the best of our ability and we can challenge some of those um, other schools of thoughts that are out there, I think it's important to also mention that unfortunately your verification agency does have the final say. I mean, they're the ones signing off the certificate. They take on that legal liability and that legal risk and responsibility. So they definitely do have weight from a... Um, from an answer perspective. So, you know, while we can advise you, it's always, always good to just um, run it by them just for safety, safety measures. So I just felt the need to say that as well. So yes, guys, from my side, thank you so much. It was lovely spending the morning with you. I wish you all a wonderful weekend. And um, yeah, that's it from us. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you all.